Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. The purpose of this presentation is to give you an overview of what you can expect to learn by taking our online training on the use of drones in humanitarian action. We've been giving this training for over half a decade now, and we've just updated it with the latest best practices and lessons learned to provide this training online. So what can you expect to learn? Well, you all understand why drone technologies are being used in disaster response. For example, down on the ground here, you can't really see the extent of the disaster damage or really identify the total number of displaced peoples. In the air, however, a drone can very quickly take thousands of very high resolution photos, like this one, helping you to quickly identify areas of damage and estimate the number of displaced individuals. Because the faster we can assess the damage and the needs, the faster local communities can get the aid that they need. By taking this course, you'll understand the different information products that one can produce using high-resolution aerial data. This is an ortho-rectified mosaic, a geo-referenced map of a heavily disaster-affected area outside of Kathmandu, Nepal, after the earthquake. You can zoom in directly, basically to the street level, to carry out damage assessments. You'll understand how other types of information products, such as 360 panos like this one, can very quickly provide disaster responders with rapid situational awareness in the immediate aftermath of major disasters. These high-resolution 360 panos are particularly easy and quick to collect and produce and therefore provide significant advantages in rapid response efforts with the use of drone technology. Here is another example to share how this technology can be used. From the ground here, you're not seeing the extent of just how dramatic the wildfires in California have been, but literally within 10 to 15 minutes, not only can you capture the imagery required to produce this 360 pano, you can actually process all that imagery really quickly. Again, an excellent way to provide immediate visual situational awareness. We'll also talk about the use of satellite imagery and the different advantages and disadvantages of satellite imagery versus other types of aerial imagery. The point here is not to suggest that one is better than the other. It really all depends on context and what kind of information you're ultimately looking for and why. This is another example from the wildfires in California that were incredibly devastating. This here is the result of aerial imagery uh, captured by drone. And you can see just how much more high resolution that imagery is. And what you can do with these orthorectified mosaics is then overlay them with other types of information products, such as the 360 panos that we just had a look at. So here, these panos are georeferenced to the location where this data has actually been captured and allowing you to really also zoom in and get another angle uh, into how affected certain areas have been following a disaster. Really providing that kind of more integrated situational awareness. We'll talk about other types of information products that humanitarian professionals have found useful, such as these sliders that allow you to quickly compare before and after a major disaster. We'll also look at the role of aerial videos in humanitarian drone missions. We'll also look at examples of how aerial imagery can be used to create 3D models that you can then annotate. And having a 3D understanding of the disaster damage can be quite insightful. Thanks to the collection of very high resolution aerial imagery, give you a sense of what areas are going to be impacted first to start putting in mitigation strategies. In this training, we're also going to cover how best to coordinate with air traffic control, other government entities, humanitarian organizations, drone pilots and drone companies. We'll talk about workflows when extensive areas need to be surveyed 
by drone. We'll focus on the importance of logistics and humanitarian drone missions. We'll talk about remaining flexible. We'll talk about how to take advantage of beach bars in order to carry out humanitarian drone missions. We'll emphasize the need to keep your team healthy. And as a team leader, it's really important for you to know how best to support the humanitarian drone pilots. In addition, we're going to give you a really wide overview of the different ways that drones have been used in humanitarian contexts. We'll draw from our own professional experience with flying labs across the world, such as in India in response to massive flooding, or in Nepal following major earthquakes and landslides, in the South Pacific in response to major cyclones and massive flooding. We'll talk about how drones are being used in Tanzania. We'll look at West Africa and Senegal, where flying labs are working with the Red Cross and national disaster management organizations. We'll look at Cote d'Ivoire, and also in Nigeria. In Peru, our partners have also been working on rapid disaster response. We'll talk about how other partners and organizations have also leveraged the use of drones in humanitarian efforts. We'll look at applications in Haiti from back in 2012, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines back in 2014. We'll look at how drones were used in the Balkans following major flooding where you had a very complex situation given minefields in the area. We'll look at cyclones in the South Pacific and how organizations have used aerial imagery to help provide more information. We'll look at the Rohingya crisis in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. For a number of these deployments that I've just shared, we will do a deep dive into these deployments and the lessons learned and the best practices that have come out from these humanitarian drone missions. We will really get to the tactical level to understand how do you actually coordinate humanitarian drone missions in such a way that they are safe, responsible and effective. We'll demystify for those of you who are relatively new to drone technology as to how exactly these drone systems actually work, what the different trade-offs are, what they're optimized for, and what they're not as applicable for in certain cases. We will give you some of the basics as to how drones operate in humanitarian deployments. We'll provide brief basic overview of how do you actually create mission plans for humanitarian drone missions to autonomously survey areas of interest and then how this data is captured and processed to produce the kinds of information products that humanitarian organizations are keen to have. We'll emphasize the importance of localization. Drones are of course not the only game in town as far as remote sensing, so we'll compare drone technologies with other types of remote sensing solutions. We'll compare the different types of spatial resolutions provided through these different remote sensing solutions. We'll look at so piloted aircraft and how these have been used extensively. We'll also look at what's coming next in terms of high altitude autonomous drones. We'll consider the ethical implications of using remote sensing. We'll look at the humanitarian UAV drone code of conduct. We'll emphasize the importance of community engagement. We'll look at privacy implications, data protection protocols. Drones are flying blenders. That is why we need to have processes in place to ensure that we are using these technologies responsibly, safely, and effectively. So we'll look at the broader drone regulations in different countries around the world. We'll go beyond the use case of mapping drones to identify what other solutions and use cases exist. Increasingly, what we're going to see is the use of delivery drones in the immediate aftermath of natural disasters. So we'll look at the work that we've done with Flying Labs and uh, other partners, such as Pfizer, with the Ministry of Health, uh, local doctors, hospitals, for rapid testing. So not just looking at the use of delivery drones to deliver essential medicines, but also patient samples. We'll see what others are doing in the cargo delivery space. We'll also look at tethered drones to provide 3G, 4G, LTE connectivity. We'll look at the potential role of virtual and augmented reality. We'll look at what else is coming up in terms of, say, swarming technology.
Beyond this, we'll also look at self-contained mini drone ports. We'll look at the possibility of doing real-time analysis, whether that's driven by machine learning or crowdsourcing. An important factor in humanitarian drone missions is time. At most 5% of humanitarian drone missions is actually spent flying the drones. The rest of the time, frankly, is swearing. There are so many factors beyond this 5% that need to be in place in order to deploy humanitarian drones. We'll talk about how to swear less. Now, I've been giving humanitarian drone trainings for over half a decade now. I've had the opportunity of working with several dozen humanitarian organizations and we're going to be using all that, all that learning, and providing this online training for you. We'll talk about how vital disaster response simulations are and how to actually design effective, informative, impactful simulations. We'll look at how this has been done, both the humanitarian drone trainings and the simulations across the world. We'll look at the importance of planning your missions in a data-driven manner. We have a number of different tools available to you to better plan your humanitarian drone mission. We'll look at how to deploy high-tempo humanitarian drone operations. We'll also look at other key topics. For now, though, I hope you found this to be a useful overview of our online training on the use of drones in humanitarian action, and really hope you will join us for this training. Thank you.